the name of the God who created us. In the name of the Christ who teaches us. In the name of the Spirit who journeys alongside us. Welcome, Welcome home, home, children, children of God. God. Good morning, church family, and welcome to online worship this morning, Sunday, May the 2nd. Please take a moment and check in by saying good morning in the YouTube chat to let us know that you're here. And as we do every week, we will send $1 for each person in worship to a local or international ministry. <clears throat> this morning's recipient is Loaves and Fishes a ministry of River's Edge Fellowship Church in Elizabethton that works to provide hot meals for residents of Carter County five nights a week. In addition to supporting the uh, Loaves and Fishes financially, which you are already helping to do by watching this morning, we also provide hot meals once one night a month. So if you are able to help, and, and that one night will be this coming Saturday, if you are able to help by providing a casserole that can serve 12 to 15 people this coming Saturday evening, May the 8th, please let Kathy Wing or Julia Rogers know. We need around 15 casseroles each time we bring food, and so I uh, would love to include you in that. Please do continue to send in new photos for Passing of the Peace as you're able. And again, uh, I thank you so much for everybody that sends in pictures of flowers and nature and landscapes and uh, everything else. I love being able to use those each week in the meditation and other parts of worship. Um, thank you for that. A reminder to session members that we will be meeting tonight at 7 p.m. via Zoom. You should have uh, an email with that information and an agenda and appropriate accompanying documentation for that. This coming Saturday morning, the Peacemaking Team will host a stream cleanup day at Laurel Fork. If you are interested and able to help with that, please contact Gary Berger for details on that. And friends, as always, it is good to be together again this morning. Today is a day that God has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it as we worship together. Amen. Good morning, church family. Today's invitation to worship is an adaptation from Romans 8 from Enfleshed. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither the things that bring us pleasure nor that which shames, neither threats from the state nor any structure of dominance, neither the legacies of harm freshly unfolding nor any that are still to come, neither the days when life feels unlivable, nor the days when loving ourselves comes easy, neither doctrines of hate, nor pastors who condemn, neither respectability politics, nor bigots, nor bullies, neither fatigue, nor passion, neither regrets, nor having zero Fs left to give, neither the struggles we cannot yet name, nor the ones that always seem to stay the same, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from love. to all those in fear we are called to 
Strike the fire and let it rise. Beltane flames need springtime skies. Ancient customs we now renew tween early morn and evening dew. Fire with warmth of summer shine, invoking spirits from early times. 
for fertile crops with sun-fed rays, gardens of plenty, and golden days. Beltane is the midpoint or cross-quarter day of spring. The last frost date is behind us. The trees have bloomed and now wear their green leaves. The sun has climbed high in the sky, and there are four hours more of daylight than there were at the winter solstice. Seeds are being planted. Birds are building nests. Butterflies are fluttering about. After a long, cold winter, summer is right around the corner. Beltane is an ancient fire festival in the Celtic tradition. Fire is used to purify and protect, but also the leaping flames show the exuberance of a world newly reborn and ready for its most fertile time. It is the fertility of babies and just sown crops, but also the fertility of mind and heart, giving us creativity for our work, our interests, our families and communities. I invite you now to open your awareness to those fertile and creative energies within yourself. What are your passions that call to you, that make you feel vibrant and alive? What is it that yearns to be planted, nurtured, and celebrated? Please rise as you wish to and are able. With our bodies and our spirits, we will join in acknowledging our connection to the cycles of the seasons. Before we begin, take a moment to orient yourself in the direction where the sun rises on your horizon. Breathe deep. Take a moment to center yourself. Connect with the rhythm of your heartbeat. After each invocation, respond with, bless us with your presence. And now facing the east. Guardians of the East, children of air, bring to us your magic winds. Fill our lungs and join us in celebration of the breath of the Spirit. Bless us with your presence. Bless, Bless us, us with, with your, your presence. presence. Make a quarter turn to the right and face the south. Guardians of the South, children of fire bring to us your sparks of laughter quicken our hearts and join us in celebration of the power of light bless us with your presence bless, bless us, us with, with your presence. presence make a quarter turn to the right and face the west guardians of the west children of water bathe us in the evening dew Revive our longing and join us in celebration of the gift of your healing. Bless us with your presence. Bless, Bless us, us with, with your presence. presence. Make a quarter turn to the right and face the north. Guardians of the north, children of earth, shower us with the gifts of your bounty. Support our labors and join us in celebration of this world which sustains our life. Bless us with your presence. Bless us with your presence. Return now to your original position. Mother Earth, with you we feel the blooming within us as the world once more is wrapped in warmth and light. We thank you for new birth, for a world awash in fertility and creation, for the glory of the lengthening day. We celebrate you and greet you in all that lives. Blessed be. Our reading today comes from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. 
Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered a man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had us in the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Good morning, church family. A couple of years ago, right around the middle of the Trump presidency, our Thursdays with Jesus book group read the book, The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels, by author and historian John Meacham. Meacham, by the way, is one of Biden's speechwriters, and he used that image of battling for the soul of America in at least one of Biden's speeches last year in December. Inextricably wrapped up in that battle for America's soul is also a battle over the soul and identity of Christianity. Two thirds of Americans still identify as Christian. And the majority, 84% of Republicans and 72% of Democrats, say that religion is an important part of their life. And just as there are these two competing identities for our country, I see tremendous overlap with the two competing identities of Christianity. One of those Christian identities, for example, celebrates the inclusion of all people and the love of God for each and for all of us as integral to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Christianity points to stories of Jesus eating with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with sinners of all sorts, and, and blessing them, welcoming them and inviting them to follow. The other Christian identity would see that same inclusiveness as evidence of forsaking the gospel, as being unfaithful to the point of no longer even being Christian, really. That Christianity also draws from the Bible, citing Jesus as well when he says things like, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. Or later in that same gospel in Matthew, when Jesus says that 
Many are called, but few are chosen. Those same competing Christian identities define our politics as well. One Christianity believes that opposition to abortion and to same-gender marriage, that adherence to conservative politics, things like that constitute the very heart of faithful Christianity. The other Christianity views restricting the rights of women to make choices over their own bodies or preventing same-gendered couples from having the same rights and blessings as heterosexual couples, that those things are themselves a repudiation of the heart and soul of the authentic Jesus movement. The arguments, political or religious, are one thing. My own personal religious views at this point are pretty definite and strongly held, and those religious views pretty heavily inform my own political views. But I still read and dialogue with conservative Christians that I respect and learn from, even if we never come to the same conclusions. But on both sides of the political lines, or of the battle lines, really religious and political, on both sides, those disagreements all too often devolve into judgment and condemnation of the other. A rabbi whose blog I occasionally read saw a distinction between what he calls arguing for the sake of heaven and arguing not for the sake of heaven. In other words, when we argue, when we dialogue, is the goal to learn from one another and to draw us all closer to a beloved community? Or is the goal to make ourselves feel stronger and more justified in our own position? Are we listening to one another? Or are we creating straw men that we can belittle and denigrate and knock down? Those questions have very little to do with who's right and who's wrong, by the way. And nor is the goal of those kinds of questions to lead us to some kind of middle ground. All too often, questions, dialogue like that, kind of descend into the idea of like, if, if you want to recarpet the sanctuary in yellow and I want to recarpet it in blue, then we compromise and we pick green. That's not what I'm talking about either. The question is not if we can find some kind of political or religious or theological middle ground. The question is more about whether or not we can see God at work in ideologies other than our own. And again, this is a challenge that transcends any particular political or religious view. Evangelical Christians' objections to same-gender marriage too often turns into oppression and exclusion of gay and lesbian people. But on the flip side of that, progressive Christians' belief in the inclusive love of God somehow turns into hatred of those with a less inclusive or more judgmental attitude, like a blanket dismissal and judgment of all Trump supporters or evangelicals. Author Philip Gully, in his book, If the Church Were Christian, sees the biblical roots of this kind of religious recrimination from both sides. The Bible contains both grace and judgment, he writes. Jesus speaks words of forgiveness, but also tremendously harsh criticism of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And Gully then goes on to write that, like Jesus, the Apostle Paul was capable of great tenderness. The 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, even after two millennia, is still stirring and relevant. And it is hard to believe that touching chapter was written by the same man who urged those in Galatians who disagreed with his theology to just go castrate themselves. This reveals the dichotomy of the Christian scriptures. 
the book whose pages justify both compassion and cruelty. Christians wishing to condemn and exclude can find justification in their scriptures. When those same scriptures are elevated as God's inerrant words, that kind of condemnation appears virtuous and even God-ordained. And I think that's the state in which we find ourselves today. The judgment and blame are believed by many to be God's will. The tools by which God's holy purposes are accomplished. And in that odd equation, coldness becomes treasured or valued even as much or more than compassion. So it feels to me like Gully has put his finger on something here in what he writes. Believing that God condemns certain people or certain attitudes or actions, then we believe that it is also our duty to condemn. And so if people who are called to self-giving love become instead characterized by judgment. And as I say this, I hope you do not hear this as just being true of others, of conservative evangelicals. Because I know that when I look with any honesty at my own resentments, I know that folks on the left can be just as judgmental of those on the right. And again, we'll find support for both in the Bible, compassion and judgment. A lot of that has to do in part with how we read the Bible. And I know we hold some differing views of how to do that, how to, how to read the Bible among our church family. So let me share how I approach the Bible when I wrestle with questions like this. I believe, personally, the Bible is best read not literally, but literarily. In other words, not looking at specific verses or details, but looking at it as a larger piece of literature with overarching themes, or what we call meta-narratives. One example of that kind of overarching theme or meta-narrative is the, the theme of God feeding God's people. Way back early in the Bible in Exodus, we get the story of manna in the desert all the way to the Gospels where Jesus feeds the masses on the hillside. In the prophets, we have Isaiah and the great feast where uh, you can buy wine and milk without uh, cost, without price, Uh, God feeding God's people. We have Jesus turn water into wine at no cost. Jesus feeding his disciples with fish and bread on the beach after he has risen, and so on. The the meta-narrative of God feeding God's people is throughout scripture and the whole Bible is replete with stories of God feeding God's people. And so it's one of these meta-narratives that stretches from beginning to end. And that's where we are, where where today's reading from Acts comes in too. This story of Peter and Cornelius, this story is part of a meta-narrative of the ever-expanding inclusivity of God. It's repeated at least three times in Acts. It is a story that is meant to challenge and to offset the holiness codes in Deuteronomy. So way back early in the Bible, we have these holiness codes that state that no Moabite is ever welcome among the people of God. And it's in there because of what the Moabites did to the Israelites when they were wandering in the desert. But then we get this meta-narrative that pushes back against those holiness codes all throughout the Bible. Back again in the Hebrew Bible in the book of Ruth, we have Ruth who herself is a Moabite woman who upholds the faith of Israel and becomes King David's great-grandmother. We have the story of Jonah, a prophet sent to the very enemies of Israel because They, too, are beloved children of God. Jesus continually eats with people who, according to those holiness codes, he should not eat with. Tax collectors and sinners, 
lepers, all of which, uh, being in proximity to, broke the holiness laws of his day. And then we come to today's to today's story. Excuse me. Peter has a vision. And in that vision, he imagines God calling him to do something that violates those very same holiness codes. Peter's vision has God asking him to break religious law. And so at first, Peter refuses. God responds to Peter by saying, what God has called clean, you must not call unclean. And so eventually Peter trusted the vision and he went to visit Cornelius. That's the story that we heard Amber read this morning. And here's where this story to me gets particularly interesting for our conversation today. Because after Peter is finally convinced to go ahead and go to Cornelius' house, Peter went with the expectation that he would be taking the gospel, taking God to this household. Peter had something that Cornelius didn't have. God called Peter to take uh, his understanding, his vision of God to Cornelius and kind of export that, right? Perhaps Peter expected to preach to Cornelius and his household to teach them, to bring them in at the ground floor of Christianity. Peter may have even expected to circumcise the men, to, to then invite Cornelius and his household to the synagogue, to teach them the law, even the law that Peter himself was then breaking, and, and teach them how to follow it. In other words, all of that, and Peter went expecting to export his understanding of Christianity to this household that is outside of the fold, that is outside of the bounds, and that was quite clearly condemned for being so in the Bible, that they, they were the Moabites, the, the people that Peter should not associate or affiliate with. So here's the surprising bit. When Peter arrives, what he discovers at Cornelius' household is not that Peter needed to bring God there, but that God was already present. Peter did not need to take God to Cornelius' household because God was already there. All the signs of God's spirit, all the marks of faithfulness were already present in these Gentiles who had a very different religious identity. Seeing the obvious presence of the Spirit of God among these Gentiles, Peter then baptizes them. And in baptizing the Gentiles, Peter essentially brings two different cultural groups, two different religious identities together. And one of the things that I really appreciate about our church is that we can claim our identity as Christians, but that we can also still see that God is already present in lots and lots of other people and other religious traditions. We don't need to take God to Muslims or Sikhs or Buddhists or atheists because God's already there. I think we would mostly, within our church family, we would mostly all agree that the grace and the work of God reaches far beyond the boundaries of our own religion. And that has profound implications for the way we respect and listen to those of other faiths. And and of those of no faith, honestly. And, and all of that has been a part of the ongoing identity of this church. But what I want to invite us to consider this morning is if we can extend that same understanding to the political and religious right. Can we, like Peter, see that God is already there, that God is already at work and already present even among those with whom we so vehemently disagree. Pope Francis, in his first encyclical, Lumen Fidei, writes that if love needs truth, truth also needs love. For love and truth are inseparable. 
Without love, truth becomes cold, impersonal, and oppressive for people's day-to-day -day lives. The truth that we seek, the truth that gives meaning to our journey through life, enlightens us whenever we are touched by love. So let me offer an example of the kind of thing I think Francis, Pope Francis is talking about when he writes that. If you can imagine an industrialist looks at a forest and sees there this vast resource of timber, but that's all he or she sees. And I think many of us would argue that that industrialist is not seeing truly. Because unless a person loves the forest, loves the trees, the shade, the smell, the sounds of the forest, then they are missing an essential part of the truth of the forest. And in the same way, you and I cannot see a field or an ocean or a forest or a people, truly, unless we love them. If all we are seeing in people is the timber resource and missing the vast beauty and love of the forest, we're not really seeing with truth if we are viewing without love. Does that, does that make sense? I ask that realizing you can't answer me because I'm talking to a camera, but, um, but I hope that it does. <laughs> the political and religious arguments in which we are embroiled are, they are indeed important. I mean, many of those arguments have to do with the future of the earth or arguments about respect for women, arguments about the importance of diversity, arguments about justice and sustainability, about economy and environment and compassion, and those are important arguments, not ones we have to compromise on. But we cannot afford to have those arguments without love. bring back the words of the rabbi I used earlier, we cannot afford to argue not for the sake of heaven. Because if we are, then we are not clearly seeing with truth. We are arguing with a straw man, with a, with a very narrow vision. And that gets us nowhere. More than that, if we want to argue for truth, then that means we have to begin with love. We have to remember that God is also on the other side, that God is already with those who are not like us. Moreover, we have to remember that God does not just love only us. We don't bring God and grace to benighted others because God is already there. That is part of the overarching theme of Scripture. That is part of that meta narrative of Scripture that we encounter again today in the story of Peter and Cornelius. And that narrative, that story, the reminder that truth is incomplete without love. That makes all the difference in the world. Amen.
forth rejoicing in God's love which is able to do far more than all we can ask or even imagine. And as you go forth this day, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind blow always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of her hand. Amen. Amen. Thank you.